There we go. My sermon today is, What Color Is Your Light? You know, if we turn to Matthew 5, this is where Christ is sitting on the mountain. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And first he starts with the Beatitudes. Blessed are you, blessed are you, blessed are you. And then he gets down to where he's telling us how we should live our life as Christians. And uh, verse, I think it's 11 or so, it talks about that we are the salt of the earth. Pastor's already given a sermon on that. But as you go down a little further to verse 14, he now talks about that we are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You notice he's saying that ye are the light of the world. It's not an invitation that he says, well, if you want to come and be my disciples and follow me, I want you, you know, I invite you to be the light of the world. Or I suggest you be the light of the world. He says, no, you are the light of the world. You see, it's not an invitation, but it's a statement that we are. Oh, wrong button. You see, when we profess to be a follower of Christ, how we conduct our life is a reflection of our perception of God and a witness of that perception to everyone we meet. When I worked with the youth, there were two things that I really tried to stress with them. One was that you need to know why you believe what you believe. And the other was that you are an influence or a witness to everyone you meet. No matter what it is, you are going to be a witness or an influence to people you meet. There's a story told, it's supposed to be true, I can't verify, but the illustration is really good. A policeman was patrolling the streets of the city, and he noticed the car ahead of him. And this car would cut people off, it would honk at somebody who was going a little slow, it was just weaving in and out of traffic. So he thought he better stop this person and find out what was going on. So he pulled up, turned his lights on, and the car pulled over, walked up, the lady rolled down the window, and he says, license, registration, proof of insurance. You know how that goes, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, some of us have had that experience. She handed him the papers, he went back to his car, got on the computer and did some things. He came back and she said, officer, why did you pull me over? He says, well, I was watching you driving. You know, you're cutting people off, you're honking your horn, you're impatient, you flipped off that guy in the pickup, and I got behind you, and I saw on the back of the car there was that fish with the name Jesus inside of it, and a cross. I knew then that this had to be a stolen car you're driving. <laughs> yeah, we chuckle at that, but you know, how often maybe we don't live up to what we are saying we are. Are we not quite what we should be? So what color is your light? Is, your, is the color of your light red? Is your witness distorted by anger? Matthew 5, 21 says, You have heard that it was said of them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and ever shall, whoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. Here Christ is comparing anger to our fellow human beings as the same as committing murder. If we are so angry at somebody, we are wishing harm to come upon them, then he says we're just as guilty as if we had actually killed them. John states it this way in 1 John 3, 15, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. So what he's saying is if we are anger, if we have anger, if we just are consumed with anger towards our fellow men, we can't expect to have eternal life. That's going to keep us out of the kingdom. That's pretty potent, isn't it? Romans 12, 19 through 20, Paul says, Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. 
for in so doing you will heap burning coals on his head. You want to get even with somebody who's done you wrong? You want to set their hair on fire? Feed them if they're hungry. Give them a drink if they're thirsty. Give them your coat if he's cold. Give them your shoes if he's without shoes. Give them a hug if he's needing a hug. Easy to say, but hard to do. But this is what we're told, that this is the way that we are to treat those who mistreat us. Don't let anger control your life. When we harbor anger in our hearts and seek to avenge or obtain justice, we are attempting to take the place of God. That's pretty serious. Is the color of your light green? Is your witness distorted by jealousy and covetousness? God looks at covetousness so seriously that he included it as one of the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20, 17. Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Don't covet it. Don't be jealous of what somebody else has. It's one of the Ten Commandments that we are to follow. Luke 12, 15, Jesus was talking to a group of people and somebody in the crowd says, Master, tell my brother to share his inheritance with me. And what was Jesus' reply? And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesseth. Don't be concerned about what somebody else has. Don't covet it. Don't be jealous of it. Hebrews 13, 5, Paul is saying, Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content for such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what men do to me. Don't worry about what somebody else is doing or what they have. Trust in God and he will take care of you. And in his letter to the Philippians, as he's closing out his letter, Paul says this, I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Man, wouldn't that be nice if we could say that? I'm content with whatever happens. Now, don't confuse contentment with complacency. We should never be complacent. We should always be striving to be better, to do more for God, to help our fellow men, but we can be content where God puts us as we do our mission for him. Don't be complacent, but be content. He's content whatever the circumstances. For I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And how did he achieve this? I can do all this through him who gives me strength. When we put our lives in God's hands, we are content and we won't be covetousness or jealous whatever other people have. See, when we covet or are jealous of what others have, we are not trusting God to give what is best for us. We're thinking we know better than God. We need something that God hasn't given us. Don't be covetous, don't be jealous. Is the color of your light gray? Is your witness distorted by complaining? Is anybody here has never complained about something? <laughs> it's human nature, isn't it? But that distorts our light. Philippians 2.14, Do all things without murmuring and disputing, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom... Ye shine as lights in the world. When we complain, it extinguishes our light. We must keep from complaining. We must accept what God has given us and rejoice in what he has given us. Because Jesus says, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all manner of evil against you because of me. People are persecuting me. People are hurting me. And I'm supposed to think that I'm blessed? How does that work? And then he says, rejoice and be glad. And the King James Version says, 
Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Wow, that is hard. But why? Because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. If we can rejoice in the persecution, we are in the same company as the prophets of old. And that's pretty good company to be in, isn't it? So let's not be whining and complaining, but let's rejoice. Now, there's a song called, The God of the Mountain is Still God of the Valley. Sometimes when we're up on the mountain, it's easy to think God is blessing us. But when we're down in the valley, we wonder, what, God, have you left us? Have you deserted us? But no, God is still with us, and we should not complain. 1 Thessalonians 5.16, Paul says, rejoice evermore. You may think, how in the world can we be rejoicing evermore? With all the trials and tribulations that come upon us, how can we just rejoice? And not only just rejoice, but rejoice evermore. How can we do that? Well, Paul tells us, pray without ceasing. Now, he's not saying on your knees with your hand folded and your head bowed. But be in the attitude of prayer. When you are driving down the highway, as I was this morning, and this pickup behind me was trying to get by me, and he went in this lane, then he came back, and then we got to a place he could... He swung around and did You know, you could get angry. He's endangering me. And what he gained? Maybe about six car lengths overall. But I said, Lord, keep me patient. Be in the attitude of prayer. Be listening for what God might give you and also be willing to send messages to God of what your needs are at all the time. Be in the attitude of prayer. Pray without ceasing. For in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. If we could learn to do this, our lives would be so much different. We would have such a different attitude to life in general if we could do this on a consistent. Philippians 4.4, 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, Rejoice. There again, easy to say, hard to do, but it brings such benefits if we could do it. Because you see, when we continually complain about our lot in life, we deny that God is merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Exodus 33, 4. If we accept God's mercy and his abundance, we will never complain. Is the color of your life blue? Is your witness distorted by despair and despondency. Despair for the material necessities of life. Now, we have material necessities. We have certain things we need to, in order to function. But are we despairing for them? But Jesus says, Oh, what man therefore of you, whom if son ask bread, will give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? If we can take care of our children and try to do the best we can for them, how much more will God take care of his children and give us the things that we need to function day to day? Jeremiah 29, 11 says this, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. God wants us to succeed. He wants us to be able to share our bounty with others. He wants us to be a light to the world for him. And so he has plans for us, plans to prosper, plans to give us hope and a future. Matthew 6, 31. Take, therefore take no thought, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you need all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Uh, around 2002, 2003, something there, I was living in Pennsylvania. The economy tanked, and suddenly I was without a job. What am I going to do? I just didn't know where, which way to turn. At that time, unemployment in Pennsylvania is something like $300 every two weeks. You can't live on that. I didn't know what I was going to do. Now, I remember uh, sitting on the porch 
of the house we were renting, I was on the phone to my dad. I said, Dad, I'm scared. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know which way to turn. And Dad said, you need to look at this verse, Matthew 6.33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Things worked out. I got a part-time job with a member of the church working in his cabinet shop. Then the conference hired me to be a Bible worker. And I ended up pastoring a church in New Brighton. What a wonderful experience that was. Greatest group of people I've ever worked with. For a little over a year, I had that privilege. Seek God first, and he will take care of you. Another one that I really love, David says this in Psalms 37, 25. I have been young, and now I am old. Yep, I know about that. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. God takes care of his people if they would just trust in him. Isaiah 33, 15. He who walks righteously and speaketh uprightly, he will dwell on high. His place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. Bread will be given him. His water will be sure. My dad chuckles and says this of this. He doesn't promise you cake and ice cream, but he does promise you bread and water. He will provide the necessities of life if we just trust him. Do you despair to feel loved and worthy? So many feel this way, especially in today's world with all the things that are happening. They wonder whether God loves them, whether anybody loves them, whether they're worthy of anything. The suicide rate is a testimony to how so many people just don't feel worthy. But we don't need to feel that way. Jeremiah 31.3, The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. If we go back to chapter 1 of Jeremiah, I think it's verse 5. God is calling Jeremiah and he's telling him, Before you were conceived, I knew you. Before you came out of the womb, I had dedicated you to be my prophet. You see, before you are e were even a twinkle in your daddy's eye, God knew you and he loved you with an everlasting love from that point. That's an amazing thought. Before you even were in the womb, God knew who you were and he loved you with an everlasting love. You are worth a whole lot to God. Romans 5, 6, Paul illustrates it this way, and this is such a powerful passage, Romans 5, 6 through 8. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Who's the ungodly? All of us. In due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely will a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Oh. And then a passage that is so familiar, but sometimes we, go, we gloss over the meanings. But John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Yes, we are worthy. Whoever chooses to follow God will have everlasting life. The cross is the greatest manifestation of God's love ever revealed to the world. Since God loves us so much, why should we allow others to make us feel unloved? Think about it. God sent his son to redeem us. He loves us so much. He knew us before we were even born. And he loves us with an everlasting love. How can we let others make us feel unloved? So then the question, is there anything that will stop God from loving us? Paul asks this question in Romans 8.35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So tribulation or distress 
or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Then he answers that question in verse 38 and 39. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, or any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You've heard me say this several times as I've talked about this text in other sermons, that I think this is one of the greatest texts concerning God's love in the Scriptures. If you ever feel unloved, if you ever feel that something isn't working right, go to the Scripture. Type it out on a note. Put it on a post-it note, whatever. Put it on the mirror in your bathroom so when you comb your hair and brush your teeth, you see it. Put it on your computer monitor at work so you can see it as you're working with work. Put it on the dashboard of your car, but don't read it while you're driving. Keep your eyes on the road. But you know it's there, and you know that God loves you. God loves you. Sometimes we run away from God. Sometimes we try to reject his love. Sometimes we just try to push him away. But whatever, God's love is still there. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. His love is consistent and everlasting. If we can't accept that God loves us unconditionally, we deny the power of the cross. God's love is manifested in the cross, and it's everlasting. It'll never, never die. Is the color of your light yellow? Is your witness distorted by fear and worry? Who here has never had a worry in their life? Yeah, right. We all have. But we can't let it linger and take control of us. Because you see, in Joshua 1.9, Jesus had met with Joshua as he's taking the place of Moses, leading the children of Israel. And in verse 6, he told him, you know, be of strong and good courage, don't fear. And then down to verse 9, he repeats it again. He repeats it very strongly. He says, have I not commanded thee? It's not... Did I suggest? Did I request? He says, I commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. There's a story here again, it's supposed to be true, and apparently my grandpa knew the individual, but there's a missionary in Africa that was walking in the path from one village to the other, and as he walked or came around a bend, and all of a sudden there was a lion in the path. And the lion sort of crouched and growled, and the missionary didn't know what to do. And suddenly he thought about it, and he started singing, Anywhere with Jesus, I can safely go. And he just sang that song that reflected that anywhere he went, Jesus was with him, and he should not be discouraged, he should not be afraid, but Jesus was with him. The lion turned around and walked off into the bush. Wherever you are, God is with you. And don't be afraid. Be of good courage. Philippians 4, 6, Paul says, Be anxious for nothing. That is hard to do. Let me tell you. That is very hard to do. But he says, Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. David, in Psalms 56, 4, says, In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust and am not afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? If we trust in God, we don't have to be afraid of what our fellow men might try to do to us. When we doubt and let worry control our lives, we're doubting that God is more powerful than anything in this world. Don't let doubt and worry control your lives. Let God take it away from you. But what color is your light? Is it tainted by one or more of the colors discussed? Or is it clear and transparent? Does the light of Christ shine unobstructed through us? Questions we each want, need to ask. If tainted by one of the lights we discussed, how can we change from our distorted light 
to God's clear light. Jesus always gives us an answer, doesn't he? 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we're cleansed from all unrighteousness. We become a different person. We become new. And Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The cleansing of our light also allows us to see God more clearly and the many blessings he gives us each and every day. But how can my small light have an impact on those around me? I want to give you the illustration of what's called the Fresnel lens that magnifies the power of a single light. This was developed by a French physicist Augustin Sean Frenzel, and this was developed to help with the lighthouse. You know, the older lighthouses, they'd have to have many, many candles as they were trying to project the light out to the ocean. He developed this lens. It's a series of prisms laid upon each other, and it uses a reflective and retractive light, and it sends a powerful light. It magnifies the power of a single candle and sends it out into the ocean to the ships. Theoretically, this could be built bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger to increase the light. There's theoretically no end to what could be done. Of course, physical limitations prevented that from happening, maybe. But you see, God takes our feeble light and he magnifies it for his glory. And there's no theory to it. It's an actual fact and there's no end to it. It can be magnified far greater than we can ever imagine. You don't know what your influence or witness might do to somebody. I've been humbled a couple times if people have come up to me and said, you don't know it. But when we were doing this or doing that and you said this or said that, I was at a crossroads in my life. And because of what you said, I made the correct decision. and My life was changed. That's humbling that God can use you to influence somebody else, but he can. I have proof of it. You should have proof of it. You may never know what your influence will do, but God knows, and he's keeping track of it. But let your light shine before God. See, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So ask the question, what is the color of my light? What is the color of my light?